All right, welcome to your first sections of chemistry. This should correlate with the Timberlake Chapter 2 uh, in your textbook for the most part. We're going to be following scientific measurement. I've actually broken it into chunks. So rather than taking on entire chapters in one sitting, what we'll look at are just different sections. And so in this first section, we're going to be focusing on units of measure, which means we'll be looking at measured numbers and then turning those measured numbers into significant figures and seeing where significant figures come from. Then in the following PowerPoints, we'll look at significant figures and calculations, prefixes and equalities, writing conversion factors, problem solving, and then we'll finish out with some application looking at density. So when we talk about types of measurements, there are two types of measurements in general. First, we have quantitative, where we use numbers to describe our measurement. And then the second type we have is going to be qualitative, where we use a description without any numbers at all. So for some examples, what I mean is this. If I said my dining room table was four feet long, then here I've given you a quantity, and hence it is a quantitative measurement. If I simply said, well, my dining room table is extra large, well, at that point then, you're just looking at a qualitative value, and you don't know exactly how big extra large could be. So it's based on a different set of standards, and that standard is not standard to everyone. If I said, it's extremely warm in here or hot in here today, again, for me, it might be hot at a very low temperature, but for you, you might be like, no, it's chilly and I don't agree with you. Again, another qualitative measurement. However, if I said, no, it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit in here, at that point, now we have a quantity, and of course, that means that there's no bias here, there's no personal uh, piece can put to that, that value, it's an actual measurement. Now, which one do we prefer to use in chemistry? Well, in chemistry, we prefer quantitative. It's going to be easy to check. Again, as I mentioned, there's no personal bias, and which means we have to agree on it. If the thermometer says it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit, then it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It doesn't matter if I think that's hot or cold or mild. 100 degrees is 100 degrees. Now, the problem with that is, and the only problem that there is, is that the measuring instrument is going to limit how good that the measurement is going to be. So in other words, when we look at a number, and we say, okay, here's a value that we've measured, and I've used 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, was it 100 degrees Fahrenheit? Is it 100.0 degrees Fahrenheit? 100.0000 degrees Fahrenheit? That number and where those decimal zeros are coming from is going to be strictly based upon the instrument itself. The instrument will limit how good that measurement can be. So what does that mean then when I say, well, how good a measurement is? Well, in science, we use two words to describe how good a measurement is. First, we look at accuracy. How close is it to the actual value? So our thermometer is telling us it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Is it truly 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or is our thermometer off? Is it really 99 degrees, but our thermometer is telling us that it's 100? The second thing we look at is precision. If I use the same thermometer over and over and over again, will it continue to give me the same value over and over and over again in the same situations. So these are the two terms that we use to determine how good a measurement is. Some things you need to watch out for, some differences between the two. Accuracy can be true of an individual measurement as well as the, the average of several measurements. So if we go back to the dining room table and I say it's four feet long and then I have each one of you come in and measure my dining room table, you know, we can look at how each one of you did and see, okay, I said it was four feet. One student said it was four feet, that's accurate. The next student said it was 3.9 feet. Maybe not as accurate. Maybe another student comes in and says, no, 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 it was four and a half feet. So again, we can look at each individual student or we could take the sum of all of those measurements, take the average. So now we'll take that 3.9, we'll take the four and we'll take the 4.5. We average them out and we get like 4.2 something. And we say, okay, is that accurate? So again, we can look at the accuracy of several measurements or a single individual measurement. For precision, you have to have several measurements. Typically, we prefer three or more, but you need at least two so that we can say, yes, it's 
precise or no, it's not. Either we're getting the same value each time we use that tool or we're getting different values every time we use that tool. So you're going to need to have an example of your own. Um, typically textbooks uh, you can find on the internet as well. Archery is usually a pretty common one in darts. I'm going to be using golf. And so I don't want you to use golf as your example. You need to come up with your own example. But in golf, if you're not sure, what we're looking at is we want to be able to get the ball into the cup. So I'm going to take three shots. And you can see that the balls did not go in the cup. Now that would be great if this was real golf but this is putt-putt golf and I was standing right on the edge of the green right at the top there and so here you can see all of my shots went to our left where the cup itself the flag was off to the right were, were those shots accurate and of course the obvious answer is no we weren't anywhere near it was I precise now remember these are the two things we use to determine how good a measurement is just because I was or was not accurate doesn't mean that I cannot or will be precise. Precision is looking at each individual measurement compared to the other measurements. So here we see all three shots are close together, and that means it is precise. Now if I look at another series of data, now we can ask, was I accurate? And of course, now we can see that all three shots are really close to the flag, really close to the cup. And so we'd say, yes, I'm accurate. Was I precise? Now, again, we don't care about the cup or the flag. We're looking at literally just the three shots. Here, once again, we see all three shots are close to each other. And so, yes, I'm going to be precise. All right. One more situation here. Well, this is what it really looks like when Mr. Caro plays putt-putt golf. It goes everywhere. And so here, I'm going to reverse the questions on us. So rather than saying, am I accurate? First, I want to ask, am I precise? And now you can see a huge difference. All three shots are away from each other. They're not even close to each other. So of course, we would say, no, Mr. Carroll, you're not precise. Was I accurate? And now here's where we have to be careful, because remember, there's two ways to look at accuracy. One, each individual shot. Are any of these shots close to the cup? We might say the one down on the bottom right is close to the cup, but I'm going to put a little thing here and say, well, I'm not on the green on any of these shots. And if you're not on the green, then you can't be close. And so, no, none of these shots individually are accurate. But remember, there's a second way to look at accuracy, and that is the average. If I start averaging these three shots, and I look at how high the first one is and how low the other two are. I look at how far over to the left one is and how far over to the right the other two are. And I start sort of taking that data points and averaging them out. Then maybe, just maybe, the average would be close to the cup. Now we have one last one here. All right, it was the 19th hole in putt-putt and we just won a free game as we were able to get a hole in one. Were we accurate? Yes, of course we were. We got a hole in one, that's pretty awesome. Were we precise? Well, that's just it. In order to look at precision, you have to be able to do it over and over and over again. If I went down to the beach and I played the same miniature golf hole each time, 10 times and only won one game, then we would say I'm not very precise. All right, so hopefully that shed some light on accuracy and precision. And unfortunately, we're not going to take a field trip and go play golf. But we are going to be able to use these numbers when it comes to terms of measurement using tape measures and other devices in the lab. So in the lab, your questions might be a little different. Three students measure the room to be 10.2, 10.3, and 10.4 meters across. Were they precise? Now here, what I want you to pay attention to is we're not looking at statistical analysis with the units involved. So if I hired a fluorine expert to come in and put fluorine in for me, and they were off by a tenth of a meter, I wouldn't be very happy, and they wouldn't consider themselves very accurate, nor would they consider themselves precise. So I don't want you to pay attention to the units per se. What I want you to pay attention to is how close they are relative to one another. So 10.3 is only a tenth away from 10.4 and 10.2. So were they precise? I would expect you to say yes to this. 
Again, I'm not going to be looking for you to take that meter and say, well, a meter is this big, and a third of it or a tenth of it would be this big, and way they're way off. Right? So I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for you to say, yeah, those numbers are pretty close to one another. Were they accurate? Now, the other thing you're going to see in Gen Chem and Basic Chem is that we always provide you the target value. So again, if we were using my dining room table again, I would tell you that it was 4.00 feet long. And that's what you would be striving for. So you'd always have a value that you can shoot for to see if you're accurate or if you're precise. Okay, so you won't be doing groundbreaking new measurements here. Um, in the lab, we'll already have the answers for you and you'll be able to compare them. Now, that brings us to significant figures. And so when we look at measurements, usually a question that gets asked is how many of these numbers mean anything? Well, we already pointed out that the instrument is gonna limit how good your number is gonna be because that's what limits all of our measurements. Now, what we have to understand is no matter how good or bad our instrument is, we're always going to make estimates. And so when we make an estimate, what we're going to do is just estimate between the two smallest marks. So if I have a ruler that looks something like this, and I'm not going to worry about units yet. We'll spend a little time talking about units soon. But here I just want to measure this green stick. And so here we can see that the stick goes longer than four, but it's shorter than five. So here, what we're going to do is estimate that stick. And most of us are going to estimate it to be 4.5, whatever the units are. And that's going to be a fine value. What we need to understand is we could say it's 4.1 or 4.9. And both of those values would also be good. What wouldn't be good is if we said it was 4.55. Notice I added a 5 on there. In order to do that, I would need a better ruler. The instrument is going to limit how good the measurement can be. Here, my instrument is in marks of one unit. That means I can only estimate down to the tenths place. Now, if I want to get past that and I want to get a better measurement, I'm going to have to spend some extra money and buy a better ruler. And now when I look at this ruler, we can see that it goes past 4.5, but it doesn't make it to 4.6. And now we're going to play that same game. So between 4.5 and 4.6, we're going to say something like 4.55 or 4.51 but we can't say 4.555. Hopefully that makes sense. We can only measure one unit past the mark on the instrument. So the better the marks, the better we can estimate. Now for scientists, what we need to be able to do is work that backwards. That's where sig figs come into play. So let's say I make a measurement and I tell you that the measurement is 142.15 centimeters. Then what I wanna know is, is what's the smallest mark on the ruler? And so here, it's going to have to be the tenths place. And that's because the 5 would be my estimate. What about 142 centimeters? Well, here, the estimate would be the 2. And so that means the 4 is the tens place, and that would be the limit. 140 centimeters, and here's where we're going to run into problems. Does that zero count, or doesn't it? Well, that's what we got to figure out next. And so to figure that out, we're going to need a set of rules to decide which zeros count. And so I'm going to start the second PowerPoint, and we'll get into sig figs. All right. So stay tuned. Take a little break if you need to. But remember, the question is going to be, here's the problem. Do, does that zero count, or does it not?